Welcome to AI for Good, the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from me as well. I am Guillem Martinez Rora from the International Telecommunication Union, and I would like to welcome you all for joining the Robotics for Good Innovation Factory Grand F Finale organized by the ITU in partnership with KUKA. The Innovation Factory is a program launched in 2020 under the flagship initiative AI for Good. It originally started as an online pitching platform for startups, and this year it has been upgraded as a more like an accelerating program. We help startups grow and scale their innovative AI and robotic solutions to achieve the sustainable development goals by providing various business opportunities, mentoring services, matchmaking with potential investors and partners, cash price, and more. After a year-long quest to find the most promising robotics startup solutions from across the globe, today I'm delighted to introduce the Robotics for Good Innovation Factory Grand Final that will award one winner for its innovative and scalable solution to help advance the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. The winner of today's session will be invited to the AI for Good Innovation Factory Grand Finale at the AI for Good Global Summit in Geneva, 6-7 July 2023. And especially today's session is organized in partnership with KUKA, AI for Good supporter, and the main sponsor of the Robotics for Good Innovation Factory. Thanks to this partnership, we were able to meet very interesting robotics startups, helping to advance the sustainable development goals. And also through this partnership, the finalists today will have the opportunity to get a cash prize of 20,000 uh, euros and exclusive mentorship sessions from KUKA. And that's why I would like to give now the floor to Ulrike Tanks Scherer, and she is the Chief Innovation Officer at KUKA to give some introductory remarks. Rike, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gulem. And dear participants, dear startup teams and fellow jury members, it's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of KUKA as one of the main sponsors of this event today. We're very excited to be listening to some of the most innovative and exciting advancements in the fields of robotics and artificial intelligence in combination with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. As we all know, these goals represent a blueprint for a better and more sustainable future, encompassing everything from poverty reduction to environmental protection. And I have no doubt that the startups that we are listening today will showcase their ability to use AI and robotics to make significant contributions towards achieving these goals. So without further ado, let us begin this exciting journey to discovery, innovation, and sustainable development. Thank you, and back to you, Gillian. Thanks a lot, Ulrike, for your invaluable contribution and for your intellectual remarks. And now I would like to give the floor to our moderator today. His name is Matt Simon, and he's a science journalist at Wire magazine. So the floor is all yours, Matt. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Uh, hello from San Francisco. A very early morning, San Francisco, but I've had my coffee. I am good to go. Um, yes, I am indeed a science reporter at Wired Magazine. I do a lot of a, a robotics coverage, and uh, it's actually really exciting to see these startups today uh, because they touch on a number of things that I have reported on in the past. It's uh, great to see how this field is 
moving forward with these uh, advances uh, quite rapidly. There's a broad range of, of really interesting startups today uh, that we are going to talk about um, and that we are going to judge, or at least the judges will judge. Um, so uh, I will go ahead and introduce those judges uh, one by one here. Uh, so first up, we have Kelly Chen, a partner at DCVC. Uh, hello, Kelly. Uh, what brings you here today? Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today, um, joining from usually San Francisco as well. Um, and for, for myself and my firm, we're an early stage deep tech VC. We're prolific investors in the robotic space. And I, I love this type of event in that it shows much more than people's common perception of what robotics can be. Um, and as you'll see today, there's just a, such a wide breadth of uh, solutions that robotics can take and a lot of solutions for societal good. So very excited to be here. Great. And thank you, Kelly. Welcome. Uh, next, we have Will Foss, advisor to the Boston Dynamics AI Institute. So we're all familiar with Spot and, and Atlas. Uh, but what else actually does, does Boston Dynamics do over there? Uh, what are you involved in? Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Will Foss and, uh, and so Boston Dynamics Robotics Company, uh, as you mentioned, has Spot and Atlas and Stretch, which is the AMR uh, based arm that does loading and unloading of trucks. The Institute is actually a fully separate entity focused on uh, the future generations of intelligent machines across athletic intelligence, cognitive intelligence, hardware design and policy and ethics of robots. Uh, so I'm an advisor there, uh, but also an investor in robotics and uh, very excited to be here with you. Great, thank you, Will. Welcome. Uh, next, we have Marab Weinrib. Uh, she's a VP Managing Director at Qualcomm Ventures Europe and Israel. Uh, welcome. Uh, what brings you here today? Hi, everyone. Um, at, I wouldn't uh, introduce Qualcomm. We're a Texas company. One of our product lines and our focus is on robotics. We have a product line dedicated to robotics. and. As the venture arm of Qualcomm, we're heavily looking into investing in the robotic space. So I'm happy to be here and uh, see all kinds of uh, exciting startups in the space. Great, thank you and welcome. Uh, we have already met Larike, but let's uh, bring Larike back, uh, Chief Innovation Offer Officer at KUKA. Um, why, I guess, have you folks decided to, to get involved in this event? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I think, or we've realized that um, the development out there is um, is too big for just one company, and uh, it's also not so easy, if you're really honest, um, to innovate everything from within. So the innovation from without, uh, or from outside of KUKA, uh, we find very inspiring. So we're looking for actually for good collaborations with those startups. And this is why um, we're excited to sponsor the prize and also be here today. Excellent. Well, welcome and, and thanks again. And last but not least, we have Tom Wrighton, Executive Director at Mass Robotics, um, which is basically uh, an innovation factory. So good that you're here today. Um, what are you folks up to over there? Great. So um, Mass Robotics is a nonprofit that supports the innovation and, around robotics, and, and we run a shared uh, workspace that houses over 70 startups. This is a great opportunity for us to learn both more about uh, what startups are doing and also uh, the exciting areas that they're working in. So I'm really uh, pleased to be here and see some of these great new startups. Fantastic. Well, thank you again to everybody for being here. Uh, so we're going to move on now into the competition. So how this works is that each uh, startup will get three minutes. I will give you a warning when you have 30 seconds left in your pitch. And then you'll have uh, each of these startups will have 10 minutes with uh, the judges for a Q&A session. Um, so I will bring up the first one here, and that would be clean robotics. So again, three minutes uh, tight, three minutes, and I'll give you a 30 second warning before you're at the end of it, and then 10 minutes with the judges. So clean robotics, go ahead. Uh, Matt, I'm not sure if we have clean robotics on the call just yet. You're on mute. Sorry, let's go with cycle wash then.
Do we not have Sakawashi there? Hi, can you see me? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, hello. Hi. Um, all right, so just get into the field. Okay. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? We cannot see your screen. At least I cannot. Got it. We see it. Go ahead. Hi, everybody, and hi, Tom. <laughs> so we are also uh, resident at the Mass Robotics in, in Boston, so um, it was nice to see Tom out there. Um, yeah, um, basically, we make uh, um, bike cleaning machines, um, which are robots, and we've been, we are starting to introduce a bunch of uh, AI in order to understand the type of bikes which go in there. It's a complex object. Um, and I just want to introduce to you uh, basically how it was done in the past. So there wasn't no proper, proper solution to, to do this. And there was a lot of wastage of water. Uh, people would use uh, pressure washer and you would land up using maybe 20 liters of water. And that was all getting drained and all, also all the chemicals were, were seeping into the ground and uh, was actually damaging the bikes. And so we, my background is I'm a robotics engineer from King's College in London. And uh, so I basically was a habit uh, rider and I I started to build this machine in 2015, um, which you can see over here. Um, and uh, so it's basically started off with a wooden box and then we wanted to make something very compact. And then it just evolved. And at the moment, I think we've washed over 1 million bikes uh, so far with 19, uh, with 200 machines installed in 19 countries. So the, I'm in the car at the moment. So I was just in uh, Denmark uh, checking some uh, machines and the robots. And then I'm going to Norway with the ferry. So I'm sorry, I'm not in the office. So. Um, so they are spread all over Europe, and uh, we have a complete solution. Uh, it's a fully automatic machine, but we also have manual stations. Uh, and basically, we have a platform idea. So it's everything stainless steel. So you can start with the basic cleaning stations uh, up to fully automatic robots, which are very, yeah, very complex and inexpensive. Um, but we are trying hard to make them affordable for everybody. And soon maybe we'll have one in, in Boston. I'm talking to the city about it. Um, so we also have small machines, which are very compact. You can take them on the cargo bikes. Um, and these are some installations, for example, these are installations in Norway, in the university, in the buildings, so bike rooms. So you can find these and place them basically everywhere where you have a lot of e-bikes now um, being promoted all over the world. Um, I think it's a really cool machine. Uh, it's 30 seconds, please. And, and self use machine. So, this is an example from Zurich. And just to show you, it's, it's very sustainable product. So, even the materials we use are reused plastics. And so, uh, we save, we use only one liter of water per wash. Um, we use very little chemicals. In fact, we use ultrasonics. Just to give you an idea, I mean, what we are trying to do here is to create an object cleaning pot. Which, which uses different methods. So not only water based, but lasers, uh, dry eyes, or you know, vacuum cleaning. And, and that's that is time, here. please. Thank you. So basically, we would like to have a manipulator from Puka to pick and place the object inside the machine and clean it. So I think this would be really awesome to have compact machines which are fully automated and changing the, the cleaning world and not destroying the environment. Great, excellent, thank you. That would be time. And this is now the 10 minutes that we're gonna open it up to the judges to ask their own questions uh, for the startup. Uh, judges, go ahead. Hey, thank you for that. Can you give us a, an overview of the environmental impact here? You, you started to allude to it, saying that it uses very little water, but to, to give us an idea of the scale of what this um, what the company can be. Um, I mean, instead of using 20 to 30 liters of water, which you use while using pressure washer to clean stuff, it's bikes as an example here, but you could be thinking about all kinds of other cleaning applications. 
and we are using and reusing the water. So we use on an average around the liter of water or even less. So it's actually, if you say, if you say we have cleaned one million bikes, you say around 20 to 30 million liters of water by just reusing it. And also the soap is very expensive, the chemicals, right? And we don't want that to be going in, in the drain and, and in, in the groundwater. So we contain that. And in Germany, we have very strict uh, laws against contaminated, contaminated water. It has to be treated. And it's pretty expensive if you don't follow the rules. You could be charged 50,000 euro fines. So yeah, and oil, oil is also a problem. So basically we're saving the environment from all these hazardous chemicals and yeah, and oil and, and using very less water and energy. So our machines are optimized to use low energy equipment. Um, so we use blowers, for example, not high pressure blowers, but low pressure blowers. So we patented that. So we have about five patents in order to make this thing compact and use low energy equipment rather than high pressure and high energy equipment. So we can even run this from solar. So our machines are running with solar power using very little water and discharging very little chemicals and reusing material in the construction itself. So all the plastic we use, the black plastic, it's actually reused plastics. Sachin, how your customers are they generally municipalities that are dis, uh, that are deploying these, or are they individuals that are coming up with a way to charge cyclists on on using this system? So we have a lot of people becoming entrepreneurs and they're buying our machines, and because they charge ten bucks, and they can actually go around the cities on on cargo bikes. And we have one example in Lyon. The guy makes like four hundred, five hundred bucks a day, which is insane. I mean, and we have municipalities, uh, big companies like Oberal, Saleva, I mean, these are really big brand names. They're putting these and using this as a marketing tool. Uh, car wash companies are putting these. So it has dual purpose of marketing and also they are attracting other type of customers, you know, not just the car drivers, but also bikers. Or for example, all the ski resorts, you know, in summer, these are mountain bike trails. I mean, in the US, it's just insane. If you look at the trails, mountain bike trails, you have just in Massachusetts over 20,000 bike trails. I mean, you can put, like in just in Germany, we, we have a market research, you can put like 15,000 units. And, and we, we finish with the development. So basically we can just mass produce these things. So just copy and clone. So, so have, if, go sorry, ahead. Go ahead. No, have you say, if you have the manufacturing I, capacity, how do, you, how do you convince people to buy in the, in the order of 20 to 50 units as opposed to one to two units? Yeah, so I mean, what's happening is an investor, he has 50 car wash stations and he's a little bit worried about the future and he's really, they are really getting into bike washing now. Because, you know, I don't know if you come to Europe, I mean, there's a lot of e-bikes I and mean, just Germany, two million e-bikes were sold last year. And they cost like the small car, it's 5,000 to 10,000 euros. But they're fun to ride. And so they, so people who live in flats don't really have the space also to do this. And they're really happy to just pay 10 bucks. The alternative would be to give it in a bike shop and wait and have an appointment and pay 60 bucks. And people are just so happy. I mean, after the wash, they are like, it looks like new and, and they are return customers. And, and everybody is just, there's a huge demand for this, especially from the public. So have you considered uh, moving to a service model where you actually make money on people uh, cleaning their bikes, because as VCs are looking for, you know, repeatable uh, revenues, et cetera. Yeah, so basically our machines are self-use. So they are standing outside 24 seven. So we are operating two in Cologne and we're gonna start like five or six more and hopefully in Boston we will have one. So we operate a few, but we enable operators to run them as a laundromat, yeah. So you don't have the, the person personal costs are very high. If you can get that off the equation, then we are talking about thirty cents a wash, and you earn between ten to fifteen bucks. It's it's really profitable, and you're doing some very very good to the environment and uh, promoting biking. And it's sustainable. So we are a successful company. We've done over four million euros of sales. So, I mean. You can call us a startup, but yeah. But this is one application, right? So we want to become a technology company and we want to keep innovating and, and use this for object cleaning, not just bikes. So we have requests for all kinds of things that could be cleaned with, with our machines. 
but we could we could discuss about that in more details. Like there's so much that could be is okay, this so the device to be used for. Maybe maybe I missed it, but what was the price point of your full wash machine? The most expensive machine we are selling for sixty thousand euros and uh, it starts at 15,000. So it goes 15,000, 25,000, 40,000, and then it depends what you put in there. So if you have eight blowers drying it after washing, it's 12,000 on top. If you have ultrasonic cleaning, it's 5,000. If you have high, 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 uh, high performance blade compressors in there, because we need very compact uh, compressors and very quiet compressors and, and we build our own. So it's, it's basically all integrated into the machine. And if you have solar power, and so depending on what you pick and choose, it can the price can go up. So all the parts we use are German parts. Okay. So these are all special photos. The um, problem is in this application we cannot use normal clean room kind of servos or whatever. We have to build our own motors, which are very high ingress protection with water and and, and dirt and oil. It's really tough to get motors off the market, which would actually do what we managed to do. So they're running under water and dirt. Mm -hmm. What type of maintenance is required by the the user of the equipment, um, and how do they recapture? You mentioned that you um, you reuse the water, um, so any of the waste material or chemicals, um, how is that uh, taken out of the system? All right, so we have like a oil separator, so it has three sections. So you have the sludge area, you have the oil area, and then you have the cleaner water. So once in a season, you could just drain it, and then you have maybe 10 liters, 20 liters of, of mud or, or oil. So it's, it's actually quite convenient. And everything we build is based on our benchmark, where we say we want to build a machine for at least without any problem running for 20,000 working hours. So we use bearings, which are basically, um, you know, can, they can pendle, like a pendulum, like they can, they can, we build our own bearings. We actually produce our own bearings, plastic bearings with self-lubricating plastic and, and stainless steel. So we don't have any lubrication otherwise because of the conditions we work with. We only use stainless steel. Uh, and basically all the motors. And so we have hardened shafts so they don't get eaten up by, by the rubber. So basically rubber wears out and the rubber wears out in 20,000 working hours, which is like half a million washers. But our machines are in Costa Rica, so I wouldn't be flying in Costa Rica doing some, some maintenance work. I can still be in Denmark right now or, or in Norway, which is, which is still fine. Um, but uh, you don't hardly, it's really low maintenance. There is nothing maintenance free in this world, but this stuff is, you know, just put them out there and have them wash half a million washers, which is 10 bucks a wash is 5 million euros. So it's a 60,000 investment and you could really have an automated solution. Yeah. Uh, what, do you have any AI integrated? Where is the AI coming into place? Yeah, so, so what we are doing is we are developing at the moment the app where you can identify the kind of bike. So we train it using DALI. So you have a kid's bike, racing bike, you have a mountain bike, gravel bike. So there are so many different types of bikes with basket, without basket. So what we do is, if for, just to give you an example, if you have a smaller bike, which is like kid's bike, we don't let the brushes run to the end. So we just stop halfway and then, so we are finishing faster. So it's just about uh, object recognition and using, uh, uh, yeah, classifying what kind of bike it is and changing the parameters on the fly using Modbus. So we have the MQTT, the Pluto, which then talks to our frequency inverters. We basically program everything on our own, so we don't use any kind of library. So our whole program is 380 kilobytes. It's actually just very low level, but it's very strong and fast and it's always working and it's very, yeah, solid. Yeah. 20 seconds left, so that might be a, a good time to cut off unless anybody has a very quick question. Do you have any competition? Nope. And we are lucky to be in that state. Okay. So what we do with the Puka would be if we can actually start working on object placing or having the bikes being pushed inside automatically, we need a manipulator for that. So I would love to work with Puka if that's possible. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll have to cut that off, unfortunately, at um, at ten minutes. Um,
but uh, uh, if you have any additional questions for them, maybe drop it in the chat and I can ask them um, while the okay. judges are away, uh, just to keep on on time here. So uh, we're going to move next to Earth Rover. Uh, same deal, you have three minutes. Um, I will give you a 30 second warning. That is a tight three minutes, um, but Earth Rover, go ahead. Okay, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for this time. Myself, I'm James Miller, CEO at Earth Rover, and we're all about lighting up the future of productive agriculture. We've got a clear vision of aiming for sustainable fuel, uh, food, not fuel, sustainable food, um, using zero chemicals, zero emissions and zero till. The challenge we're trying to address, the problem we're trying to solve, uh, is the fact that weeds compete with crops for water, light, nutrients, and of course, therefore, reduce the yield in the crop. That means we need to control the weeds. Every year, the most cost-effective way of doing that at the moment is by spending £30 billion on herbicides and putting about a million tonnes of that chemical into the environment. This is becoming increasingly unacceptable across the, across the base from customers and regulators and is clearly unsustainable. Compound that with the problem that herbicide resistant weeds are being reported in ever increasing numbers of crops and countries with 92 crops in 72 countries reporting this as a problem. The farmer's faced with a choice. He's either got to continue using chemicals for weed control until such time that regulation or customer demand dictates otherwise, or the weeds dictate otherwise, or he's got to adopt practices that generally increase the cost of food production, which we know is not necessarily acceptable to the consumer and the supermarket chains, uh, but also increase the greenhouse gas emissions and mean that they've got no chance of achieving their net zero targets. At Earth Rover, we've developed clause concentrated light autonomous weeding and scouting. It's a lightweight autonomous field robot that makes use of state-of-the-art image processing, AI, and GNSS RTK satellite navigation. You'll see in the images in the top right, we've got lay, uh, concentrated light targeting weeds in the field, which are both precise, efficient, and eye safe. We target the meristem of the weed, so we only put as much energy as we need just to destroy that single small weed and therefore making it vastly more efficient than anything else you can put on the field at this stage. That means we are then therefore able to run purely on battery and solar power, uh, which means we're of course environmentally friendly through carbon neutrality and highly economical for the farmer. Doesn't have to put any, any diesel into it at all. And while we're in the field, we can gather crucial crop data at a per plant basis. 30 seconds, please which means we've got one and a half meters above the ground to get this data. We'll cover off in detail the two elements of AI-based Meristem detector and the AI-based scouting intelligence in the q and I'm sure. Uh, but just really to say what's the impact, we can cut cost, improve labor productivity and crop yield with no crop damage. We can reduce herbicide use by 100% and have no tillage in the soil, which means we're not disturbing any more greenhouse gases than necessary. We can impact 13 of the seven SDGs. So I look forward to your Q&A. Great. Thank you very much for that type three. Um, I should also mention that for the audience that has questions, uh, you can actually put that in the AI for Good Neural Network chat room. Um, that will then be dropped into Zoom for us to answer um, when the judges go off and, and make their decision. Um, but for now, we have... 10 minutes uh, for this startup, and I will pass it over to the judges now. Can I start? Um, I would be very interested in your competition against uh, whom are you competing or what is the status quo against that Europe? Well, our initial target market is organic farmers. Uh, so the only options open to them are mechanical weeders that are either automated or mounted on tractors or it's hand labor. So our main competition is diesel driven and, and can't get to within say two centimeters of the crop without damaging it. It can't go into the field when it's wet, um, which means we can of course, and we can get to one millimeter accuracy of the meristem of the weed, getting very close to the plant um, that we're trying to protect without damaging it. So that's one competition. The other competition, as I say, really is hand labor and that's hugely expensive if it's available at all. Mm 
you have any of these systems deployed currently or, or kind of what's your status? We do. We currently have field trials going on. We're two farms in the UK at the moment, and we've got three further ones planned in Europe later this year. Can you talk about speed in terms of, say, killing the weeds and then speed of, say, compute and, and what the precision is for, for actually attacking the weeds? Yep, for, for the weed killing, we're at 60 weeds per second based on the current size and configuration of the modules you saw on screen. We can configure those modules. It's purely modular. Three wire connection uh, is all that's needed. So we could increase the capacity of that very quickly, uh, but we're firing at 60 weeds a second. Now the speed across the field is entirely dependent on the number of weeds in each spot. And one of the data points that I just flashed up on the image you might not have seen is showing you the weed density across a field. It's non-uniform. So our rover only spends as much time in one location as it needs to before moving on to the next. If you look only at organic uh, market, how big is your target market? Uh, we're currently targeting 3.1 million hectares across UK, Europe and US as our primary market. And that's in organic brassicas and moving as we get towards 2020, uh, 2030, when a 50% reduction in chemical use is expected by EU government, we will expand into some more commercial markets as well. Is the system fully autonomous um, and um, how does it do at the end of the row? Um, can it plan to rotate and do the next row or does there have to be some user intervention? And then also related to that is how much space is not utilized or how much growing area is not utilized or, or not covered by the robot just because it's inaccessible. So I'll answer that second question first. It's 100% of the current organic planting operations because it's based around a two meter bed width. So it covers all of the crop. It can auto turn at the end of the row. It's no more complicated to program than your standard tractor auto steer system in that respect. The only thing a farmer would have to do or a farm hand would have to do is deploy it to the field. And in future, we would look to have charging stations with the units on the field. How often do they need to use it on a row? Uh, per row? We're, we're looking at three times per season to go in because we've got 90% plus effectiveness at killing weeds. And I mentioned earlier about these tractor mechanical devices. Uh, they're barely 60% effective. So we're 90% effective per pass. And we're expecting to do two to three passes per growing cycle. How do you reach these farmers? Uh, are you using distributors? Are you targeting them individually? How are you selling into them? Well, one, one joy of having a co-founder who's a fifth generation farmer and converted his farm to organics uh, means that we do have automatic access across the first target market. Um, we know that network very well through those connections. So that's our primary target customer base. As we move forward, we would look to go through distributor network and that would either be through the manufacturers or the input companies or the suppliers of those seeds or chemicals. What's the cost of your solution? Uh, at the moment, the ro Claws robot will be 75,000 pounds per unit. And we'll put a, a small charge for data and maintenance on top of that so we can provide the scouting data back to the farm office and ensure that it's up, it's up time throughout the season is there. What does the farmer need to do for initial deployment? So as in what is the initial, I guess, mapping look like? What Basically, as soon as you get onto their farm, what needs to happen before the, the weeds can be killed? So you would have to identify the plot on a simple map, a simple Google Maps or street map, uh, identify the geofence for that field, and then identify what's known as an AB line. And you just mark that AB line, set the implement width, and then it will automatically track up and down the rows as you go through that field. Beyond that, nothing else to intervene until you replant the next season. How much does the rover weigh? And uh, how long does the, well, 
obviously it runs on solar power, but if it's if it's a cloudy day or whatever, how long does the battery uh, provide uh, operation? Yep, so it's less than 350 kilos, which is what enables it to go into the field before tractors can after wet weather or, or heavy irrigation. Uh, the solar panels will enable it to operate eight hours per day. And without the solar, we've got a four hour range. Are you starting to get information on uh, how long your product has a usable life or what the replacement um, key criteria are, which parts break, how frequently they break down, things like that? Yep, we're starting to get that image. We've got a design life for three to five years. And part of that is gonna be driven by the technology as well. Um, it's not necessarily a major problem for most of the components in it. 90% of the components are off the shelf. Some of the components will last 10 years plus. Um, what will wear out are simple nylon bushes um, and obviously other, other small rotating bearings and things like that, all of which are normal to be replaced. Are there any crops that provide coverage so that you don't have access to the weeds that you can't, I'm assuming it's a line of sight to, with your, with your, um, your elimination system, whatever you call it, your laser or whatever, so. Yep, correct. We have a stereo camera on the underside of the, of the robot that takes a picture every time it moves its steps up the field. That will photograph all of the weeds around the crop it's trying to protect. The aim of this is to go in early when the weeds are smallest, which means you can use the least amount of energy. And as I said, we can target down to a one millimeter meristem diameter. So we're capable of targeting some very small weeds before they grow into anything that's too difficult to control. If we come to 45, 50 days in the crop cycle, the crop canopy is already over the weeds. Therefore, it's not competing for anything. Therefore, we've, we've done our job. Any other questions? Have you considered other applications down the road that could use the same system? Yes, we've got, uh, as I said, our first target market is organic brassicas and, and lettuce. And we've already had inquiries for both uh, tree production for seedlings of trees where herbicides not really an option because it kills off obviously the seedlings. Um, we've also had other crops on the, across vegetables and other areas, root crops. No, I meant, I meant uh, not only the, a different application. Uh, oh, beyond, target, that, beyond targeting weeds. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is there anything else not that the, stage, the robots no. could do? Okay. No, we, we, have, we have quite a substantial amount of work to be able to build all the units we need to support 3.1 million hectares, uh, and then another further 2.5 million hectares if we take our next crop uh, on board as well. Um, to put that in perspective, that's going to be in the region of two and a half thousand rovers. But never say never. We like solving problems. <laughs> what's, what's the average size of an organic farm? And um, are there large uh, industrial farms that could afford this equipment? Because it seems like most organic farms are small and the price of this seems to be uh, maybe outside of their range. So how does that work? Yep. A lot of the organic farms we're talking to, the ones looking at getting rid of chemicals as well, are in the thousands of hectares. Uh, so we, we've got substantial size farms already engaged. What we've also found from talking to some of the more commercial farmers is actually the cost of what they're putting on the ground now in terms of herbicides, and the amount of times they have to go through in a season to do it, it is becoming more expensive. So actually at 75,000 pounds per unit, it's becoming a more cost effective option for certain crops as well. Great, that's actually right at time. Thank you to the judges for all those great questions. And uh, just a reminder that uh, the audience can leave questions in the AI for Good Neural Network chat room. Those will then get dropped into the Zoom uh, that I can pass along to the teams as the judges are making their decision. Um, so we're going to move on to the next startup now. That would be Needle Eye Robotics. Same deal, three minutes tight. Uh, I will give you a warning when you have 30 seconds left. So Nidalai, please take it away. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, good good morning to our colleagues in, in the United States. So here is my presentation. I'm Paolo Fiorini, the CEO of Nidalai Robotics. And I want to talk about 
our first product that is uh, prostate theranostic. So combining diagnostic and therapy in a single, hopefully in a single session. And in order to, to reach this very ambitious goal, we have a first uh, near-term objective, which is developing a new product for uh, prostate cancer diagnosis. And then we move to therapy and keep in mind that uh, prostate therapy is changing and I will address that later. And in doing so, we want to do it with a very low cost, high performance system to try to uh, make a, a robotic and AI affordable to everybody in every country. The clinical problem in prostate cancer, cancer it uh, is uh, very uh, affecting a large number of people, especially men, of course, and one out of 10 uh, is, is, uh, will be affected. And uh, to, in order to diagnose this, uh, prostate cancer, you have to go through a biopsy, and this biopsy is affected by a very large diagnostic error due to four main error causes, and this delays the treatment, or the opposite side generates an overtreatment. So it, it generates a lot of losses for the uh, health system. Biopsy is a poor procedure because because the refund from the system, national systems is very little. And so it's done quickly by, by me medical in trainings. And the, the treatment for the cancer is uh, basically changing right now. So we are developing oh. some, some, process, some uh, solution to address these errors uh, based on AI to target identification, robotics for needed guidance, and the workflow standardization. Uh, the market right now is the prostate biopsy, but because we want to address a low-cost device, we want to go to the ambulatory use. And so, you know, the, the outlook is very promising. And we want to address the future market, this transition from the total prostatectomy, which is a very expensive intervention, to focal therapy. And hopefully in the next few years, there will be medical guidance to do that. And the growth strategy that we have is basically to get uh, as, as far as we can uh, uh, grants from national programs. Here we have, uh, we just started with the European Innovation Council grant. We got another grant from the uh, ERC proof of concept. And we are pairing with Center of Excellence to start clinical trials as soon as possible. And then of course, for the therapy, we are looking for other grants. Our team is composed by a very strong advisory board. Uh, the team of my colleagues, my former students in the company and the support of the University of Verona for the economics study and for the clinical part. And thank you very Thanks. much for your attention. Oh, just to jump in at the end there, Paolo, we didn't see your slides. I tried to jump in a few times, but I didn't know whether you were showing your screen or not. Uh, you should. Know going through a presentation because we didn't see any slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I try. I tried to jump in a few times, but um, you were racing through. Okay, you're right. I, I couldn't hear you. Sorry. That, that's okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so I, I guess in the meantime, I can have the judges start to to jump in here with their ten minutes of questions. And and Paolo, if you do, if you're able to actually bring up those slides and uh, while the judges are asking their questions, that sure, would be sure, I, I can do it. Sir. All right, let me bring up this slice. I, I thought I'd done it, and I because I I was seeing my full screen and I didn't uh, see the okay. Uh, there it is. Okay. So all right. So the, these are the slides. Unfortunately, sorry for this stupid mistake of mine. In the meantime, judges, go ahead and jump in so we can keep the yeah. schedule here for ten minutes of questions. So how long is the regulation process for such a solution? What do you need to do in order to go to market? Well, uh, we the, the IC grant that we got uh, uh, will fund us for the next three years, and we will be able to reach, uh, as, as I mentioned here, uh, the uh, basically the pre-product and the clinical trials in the next uh, three years, the, the regulation, and the two years for the clinical trials. So I think that by 2025, we should be able to get uh, the clinical trials done and go to the full uh, C mark and FDA regulation. Okay, I would be interested in your competition. I think that there are more uh, teams working on that, more companies uh, having solutions. Um, if I'm not wrong, 
So what's your competition and what would be your unfair advantage uh, against your competition? Well, there are there are a number of products on the market, but only one is a robotic solution, and this robotic solution is not really uh, as, as doesn't really have any any strong market penetration, and uh, we are pairing uh, through this uh, European uh, project with one of the centers in Europe. Actually, there are only three centers in Europe that has one of these robots, which is made in Singapore, and uh, we will address all the shortcomings of that product and come up with a much better product, hopefully. You could, can you elaborate what would you what are your advantages or well yes <clears throat> they, they, well they have to go into some technicality uh, so when you do a prostate biopsy there are several ways to do the biopsy um, either a full coverage uh, basically sampling all the quadrants of the of the prostate or and uh, basically inserting a needle through a, a grid based and going through all the different uh, uh, position uh, of the of the prostate, or having a focal biopsy, which is uh, basically centering centering only the uh, only the uh, areas that have been marked as as potential tumors uh, on the on the pre uh, operative images. Uh, the competitor has only this second way to do it, and it goes to a fixed position, which uh, may not be the, the one that the, the surgeons want. Instead, we want to do all this uh, um, virtual grid and uh, this single focus uh, uh, entry points. And then uh, their uh, algorithm for selecting the targets, identifying the process and so forth are black boxes that uh, do not work very well. And the third point is that they do not compensate for the, the motion of the patients. So if the patient moves a little bit up to uh, one, one and a half, two centimeters, then they have to restart the whole procedure. Instead, we will be doing a real-time monitoring of the prostate and compensating for the motions of the patients. Thank you. Can you talk about technology readiness and what still needs to happen before clinical trials? Yes, that's that's an important question. Um, when we uh, started this uh, project, the European project, we already are at the TRL4 because we had the previous project that I didn't mention here, in which we uh, have a previous prototype in which we did some preclinical -pre testing in laboratory and on cadavers. And we reached the accuracy that we wanted. Basically, the, the target size of the lesion is about five millimeters, which is under which the, the cancer is supposed not to be dangerous at least has to be monitored, and we have an accuracy of two millimeters. So uh, this is the, the initial point of our study. To reach the, the certification, we need to uh, do all the industrialization and safety testing, and then we can start uh, with some uh, ethical committee approval, the uh, first in men trials, hopefully, as I said, in a couple of years from now. Fortunately, the, the IC project that is funding us, we cover all the preclinical testing and all the pre-certification testing. And so we'll be ready at the end of the project to have uh, the full certification and then the product ready for marketing. What's the relationship with the University of Verona? How much of the IP do they own? How much of the technology do they own? Or is it all completely owned by Needle? Oh, well, we have a single patent that we have negotiated and it's been transferred. Uh, the, the, the usage has been transferred to the company and we are going to pay some royalties to the to the university. That's the only thing. The, the, the new patents will be developed by the company and so there will be no uh, interaction, no, no dependency from the university. Okay. Is there a potential to go towards other cancer types or other biopsies? Uh, well, uh, yes, yes, certainly. But even the the, the simple, well, the only the, the, the market, the prostate cancer by itself is very promising. Well, <laughs> it's, it's sad to say so, but uh, because there is a change in, in the therapy. So basically right now, the therapy for prostate cancer is radical prostatectomy. And depending if you are in a rich hospital or a less rich hospital, uh, then you can use a robotic uh, solution or not. 
so we, we the transition will be as it happens for breast cancer that from the total removal of, of the breast we went to partial removal and then focal therapy and the same thing is happening for prostate cancer so we expect in it in the next uh, uh, three to five years, there will be the medical guidance to do focal therapy. So this will mean, according to our colleagues, uh, physicians, that about 70 or 80 percent of people who will go undergo a radical prostatectomy will be will qualify for focal treatment. And so we have this huge growth of, of opportunities. And of course, it will be an enormous saving of time and, and the resources because the focal therapy will be much less expensive. As I said at the beginning, hopefully the patient will come to the medical hospital, we get the MRI, which is the, the, the let's say the second step of, of diagnosis. The MRI will show that there is a, a positive or a, a possibility of a cancer, then there will be the biopsy. And because of the characteristic of our system that can be repeatable and return on the same place where the, the biopsy has been taken, let's say in the afternoon, we can do the treatment and the patient can go home in the evening cured by a cancer, from a cancer that he didn't know to, that he had. So that is, as I said, the dream of, of all uh, urologists. When you look at uh, go to market, is there a, a partner that you could go with and save yourself going to a hospital by hospital or chain by chain? No, of course, we will not do that. Uh, we, we we are starting going to hospital and hospital when we are doing these clinical trials. So we're pair with, uh, uh, right now we have two, three, four uh, clinical partners, two in, two in Italy, one in Germany, one in the UK, to do this uh, preliminary preclinical testing and then the clinical testing. And once we have the credibility, then we try to find a partner for the marketing and the, uh, perhaps also the, 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 the fabrication, but we don't know yet, but certainly for the distribution and for the, 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 the sales. Who would be a typical partner? Is it a, a, a Philips or do you like or something else? Well, for instance, in Italy, we have a, the, 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 the company that is marketing the intuitive robotic, intuitive surgical robots, and uh, they are interested in, in considering this as an alternative to uh, the use of the robot. And we'll explore different possibilities similar like this. In Spain, it's the same situation. Uh, Intuitive is not marketed directly by Intuitive. The Da Vinci robot is not marketed directly by Intuitive. And so we'll try to find the good compromise for, for accessing the hospital without investing in creating a sales force. Okay, we're down to one minute, have a little bit of time for a very quick question, um, but if not, we can move on. All right, I will take that as a no. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation. We're going to move on to the next presentation here. That is from Rafka. Uh, go ahead, take it away. You have three minutes with a 30 second warning. Oh, we can see your slides, but I believe you're still on mute. Can you hear me now? There you go. Great. Thank you. Perfect. So uh, just a second. Yeah. So I'm. my name is Johannes Schäferhoff, and I'm the CEO of Robcom. We are transforming healthcare with AI and robotics. And you see our first product here, the um, Afridis ultrasound robot, which we use for diagnosing rheumatoid arthritis, which is a heinous disease that affects 1% of the population. It is an autoimmune disease and chronic, and patients suffer after six weeks of going untreated, already irreparable joint damage. It affects um, three times more women than men, putting them at a severe disadvantage in the workplace because one in three patients can't work after five years of the disease. There's also a huge problem in absenteeism. Um, this is not because there are no good drugs available. The problem is that 40% of patients in a recent trial in Switzerland 
waited more than two years for an examination confirming the disease. Quality of life is severely reduced and pain is massive. Um, it also increases the healthcare costs um, and sends it ballooning essentially. And this is expected to worsen because the disease is growing due to demographics while the number of doctors is declining. The way we want to attack the problem is by being or having an autonomous robot, uh, which has 97% uh, agreement with a human rheumatologist in diagnosing the disease. It can vastly uh, improve the productivity of uh, rheumatologists. It's AI powered. It is consistent and objective in its diagnosis, and it is a plug and play um, technology with existing ultrasound technology. So like I said, it's two times the number of patients that you can triage with the system. It also is really, really well accepted by patients, which is I think the other crucial number. 92% of patients in the study that we conducted wanted alpha to be part of the routine. We offer great advantages to four groups, hospitals, which are the people that are buying this machine, rheumatologists, patients, and society at large. Because this problem is massive and there, it has been around forever, there have been many uh, tries at creating a solution, but we've found the first autonomous and objective and fast and cost-efficient solution. The only other automation solution is um, subjective and is also not reimbursed, which we are. 30 seconds, please. The business model is that we have a hybrid of selling the machine and then having a license and an overrun. The market is huge for this technology. Many of the household names in uh, Europe's top hospitals, Karolinska, Charité, et cetera, are committed. And we are currently running three, uh, three Robkas or three Arfras in Denmark. And I'm expecting to do or to have five up and running in the next two months. We won a bunch of awards, including one from KUKA for innovation in health. And we won all awards at the European Robotics Forum this year in Odense. The team is great. That, that would be time. Thank you. We got to keep it to three minutes. Thank you. Uh, all right. And I will now pass it to the judges for 10 minutes of questions. So can you explain a little bit about how the system works? Um, does the patient uh, pretty much do everything in terms of positioning themselves or is still there a doctor required to, to yeah, interface with the machine? Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm still sharing the screen. I'd like to stop sharing the screen. That's okay, Johannes. I stopped sharing it for you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the way it works is that the patient comes in, scans their social security card, and then um, the uh, robot essentially takes over. So we have this little handlebar uh, at the top of the robot that three-dimensionally maps the hand of the patient. Then based on this uh, mapping, um, we determine the landing sites for the uh, ultrasound probe. The ultrasound probe then lands and does a sweep, just you know, going side to side like a human operator would do. And then um, we have an AI in the background, the QualiNet, which um, compares what it is seeing with an ideal vision of what it wants to see in order to judge the anatomy um, to later diagnose the patient. Um, and then once it's once it determined that a certain angle is best, it zooms in on that, takes the images in grayscale and power Doppler. This then is moved to um, as an, an another AI, which then grades the images according to the uh, gold standard grading system, which is Eula Omerak. It's a totally rules-based grading system, which says, for example, swelling, no swelling, um, Doppler points in the joint, no Doppler points in the joint, how many Doppler points in the joints, and then we grade from zero to three, which fits perfectly in all the treatment algorithms. This is then automatically saved in the electronic patient journal. And are you manufacturing uh, the entire system or are you buying like uh, an existing arm and existing components and then putting the assembly together? Yeah, we are, we are only buying off-the-shelf components. So we are buying a standard, um, standard P GPU PC um, and, and, and have uh, standard off-the-shelf components, cameras, etc. And then some may have recognized it. There is a, a KUKA arm that we use. Um, that was in order to uh, speed up the go-to-market. And we've been able to do the 
um, the CE certification according to MDR in one year's time, also thanks to the documentation that PUCA already provided. Yeah. Can you say something uh, regarding the accuracy? So the results, um, how many yeah. positive or positive faults are there? Yeah, so uh, the I don't have the latest information right here, but we have this nine, nine, actually 97.5% accuracy. And um, the, the, the robot errs on overdiagnosing, that's intended. So um, what we want to do as the first major use case is we want to do um, triage. So typically there's 18 patients that hit a rheumatologist being referred uh, from a GP. And out of these 18, one has the disease. So what we want to do is, is that Arthur and the blood sample are being, Arthur analyzes the ultrasound images and takes them. And then the blood sample is analyzed, which is already automated in the lab. And then based on that, you decide which patients need to be seen urgently, which don't have the disease. And you, the ones that don't have the disease are essentially queuing in the wrong queue. And the queues here are long. So you might you know, end up sitting in a queue for more than half a year, even two years. Um, and that's terrible. So the, the, the robot is great for, for that. And the business model is pure sales of the system, or do you have any service component? Uh, we have two. We have a. We have essentially. We have. Uh, we have essentially four components. We have the initial sale of the machine for 150,000 euros. Then we have a software uh, subscription of 60,000 euros for up to 4,000 scans. After which it's seven euros per scan. And then we have a, a 24 hour service fee of 15,000 euros. And we have some hospitals that have applied uh, for, for funding for this. Um, and we hope to have the first sale this month in Denmark. That would be my next question regarding the, the hospitals and their willingness to pay because we just stopped the project um, that we wanted to do in hospitals because there is a big need for it, but uh, hospitals are not willing to pay amounts like that. So what is uh, your learning so far? How, how do you think you can tackle that? I think that the key thing to understand in uh, robotic solutions in healthcare is reimbursement. And in our case, there is reimbursement. So ultrasound is reimbursed as a gold standard modality in every single health market in the EU. The reimbursement uh, level is obviously different from country to country. Uh, a private patient in Germany, for example, is about 90 bucks. Um, in Switzerland, it's 120. And you know, there's, then there's also uh, countries where the reimbursement is lower, of course. But, we want to start here, and then I think we can greatly increase the usefulness of our system by also diagnosing more diseases just by scanning the hand. Help, you know, I, when you were doing the slides, you flashed quickly over the market size and said it's huge. Can you help me think about yeah. the market size? How many machines, how many sites, how many operations? Yeah. The... Yeah. So the way we, so I, mean, I, I can explain it also like this. So the way we currently think about market size is that we are an automation solution. So we ask ourselves how much work can we automate away? And all of the major um, medical associations say that ultrasound is just as good as a physical exam. So the physical is, is currently the, the bottleneck. Um, when we look at patients, we look, we divide the markets into incidence and prevalence. So how many patients exist and how many are added every year. When we look at existing patients, it's a chronic disease. It needs to be monitored three to four times a year. So you can you know, calculate how many patients do I need to scan three to four times a year. And then we calculate that. Then we have that, that number of, of, of uh, disease assessments. Then with the new patients, like I mentioned, there's about typically, that's confirmed in Germany too, 18 patients hitting the rheumatologist. So you take the number of incidents, multiply it by 18, and then you have the number of scans that you have for new patients. Once we uh, look at that, we assume that a typical rheumatologist can do about two and a half scans an hour. And um, Arthur is actually faster than the human rheumatologist. And we calculate uh, based on 
how many hours uh, of, of work can be saved and at what price point these hours typically come um, being done either by a doctor or in very few and rare cases by a nurse. And that's how we get to 1.5 billion for just RA. And there are several other diseases that are, that are relevant, obviously OA, um, then psoriatic arthritis, PSA, which can also be diagnosed in many cases in the hand. Um, and then there is uh, there are also various tendon disorders that you can have. And so then the so, thesis is that uh, you remove the diagnostic time for the rheumatologists, and so therefore the rheumatologist can spend more time on treatment or alternative diagnosis. Yes, exactly. That the rheumatologist can tr spend more time with the patients, uh, explaining you know what is what is happening, changing medications seeing more patients. I mean, you have to bear in mind here that even in, in countries like, you know, Germany, Switzerland, I mean, two, two year waiting time is, is, is totally unacceptable. Uh, when I talked to one doctor in, in, in Dusseldorf, he said, uh, we have only two weeks waiting time. And I asked, how do you do it? Well, we don't open the floodgates. We rather treat few well than everybody poorly. So there's a, he thought there was inexhaustive demand. I think that, of course, it can be exhausted, but there is a huge demand that is currently going totally unserved. There's also a question of, there's many pharma companies interested in this because they are also suffering from bad results when their drugs are prescribed very late. And these drugs are, are, are very powerful drugs. They kill your immune system, essentially. So you don't, you, you want to, Get the dosage down therefore you need to monitor but i mean for the drug companies it could be great to get better results and it could also be great financially because these drugs i think cost on air like average the average patient in the us is expected to pay twenty thousand us dollars just for medication every year so there's there's a lot of i mean we can do a lot for society like i said for society uh, for the patients, for the hospitals, the business case for the hospitals there too, which we're very excited. <laughs> that actually brings us to 10 minutes. So thank you for all those excellent questions. Uh, just a last reminder that for viewers who want to ask a question, you can drop that in the AI for Good Neural Network chat room. Uh, those will then be brought into this Zoom for me to ask the competitors um, while the judges are making their decision. Uh, and so lastly, we have uh, coming up here, uh, Clean Robotics to present for three minutes. Uh, again, you'll have a 30 second warning, but uh, Clean Robotics, please take it away. Awesome, thanks. Uh, Zach Wayman here um, from Head of Business Development here to talk to you about Clean Robotics and TrashBot. Um, so I think we've all been to a sports game or a stadium and realized that recycling isn't the easiest thing when you're not at home. Um, so we really try to help uh, avoid inaccurate sorting, trying to keep contamination out of the recycling stream, allow facilities to collect better data, and then also really educate the users um, in a relevant way to the setting. Um, so basically what we're doing is changing the way that we sort at essential facilities. Rather than having you pick the result, pick the bin you throw items into, um, we kind of automate that process and then educate users with the included screen. Um, some of the exciting people we're working with currently are massive hospital systems here in the United States, as well as a lot of our airports. Um, hospitals include Stanford, or Stanford Medicine here in uh, the US, as well as Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Um, but we're also starting to work with large property owners such as JLL, um, currently looking to hit about 600 trash bots this year. Um, right now we're at 414, so super excited. I think we might actually break a lot of our goals there. Um, but basically TrashBot works by you know, depositing your item, using a computer vision system to figure out what bin it should go into and collecting data in the process. So we just really make sure the initial collection is clean so that these materials can actually make it to material cover recovery facilities, you know, work their way into new products. Um, and for our customers, you know, they have uh, detailed waste audits based on what's being thrown away on a day-to-day -day basis, which is a huge deal. It just gives them actionable information to make decisions around. Um, this is just a demonstration of our interactive content. So when you throw away a water bottle, you're going to get PET education. When you throw away a compostable item, likewise. Um, we find this is a lot more engaging and less overwhelming for the end user. Um, just really allowing us to broaden our impact beyond, you know, the physical sorting of goods.
Um, we have an amazing team that we've assembled. Um, everyone from, you know, some really experienced hardware engineers from CAT to um, people that have worked, you know, in technology and innovation with large corporates for a number of years. Um, and we're actually currently in the process of raising a $20 million Series B to accelerate the, our efforts. Um, we think there's a massive opportunity internationally. Um, definitely appreciate the Switzerland audience here. Um, that we hear a lot of people over in Canada seconds, having please. similar issues. And um, yeah, we're really excited to see where this is going to take us. I guess I, I got done a little early that time. That's the end of my TED talk. Oh, good. We're catching up here. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I really appreciate that. Uh, we are then going to throw it to the judges here for 10 minutes of additional questions. Can you talk about the, the incentive of the end buyer here? So you spoke a little bit about yeah. getting the, the insights from there. How about on the financial incentive side? Yeah, hundred percent. So here in the United States, we've really seen a lot of municipalities um, artificially inflate the cost of landfill respective to recycling. I mean, I'd say that's where you see the largest, you know, most direct economic impact. Um, aside from that, labor is really expensive here in the United States. So what we do with the system is we actually um, will let you know as the bins need emptied as well, um, just making it a lot more efficient in facilities where you're looking at anywhere between 500 and 1,000 waste receptacles. To talk a little bit more about the system, can it accept virtually anything that's thrown into it? Um, and then how do you separate mixed trash? Or are you expecting the consumer to put in one item at a time? We typically expect consumers to place items one at a time. And what we do is we can actually analyze what ensembles of items consist of. Um, so we're using an object detection model, which means that we can then go to the facility, hey, maybe you should make sure your cups and your plates are heading to the same waste stream because people are depositing them at the same time. Um, generally, our rule of thumb is like whatever's easiest for the end user is where you're going to see the best result. And to address your initial question, um, you know, anything that can fit within that sensing chamber, I'd say it's about the size of a shoebox, um, is something that the trash bot can receive. And we actually custom calibrate how we're kind of sorting and identifying those items based on the region we're operating in, since there's so much, you know, kind of ambiguity amongst uh, different municipalities. A couple of questions on the technology front. So <clears throat> as the bins fill up, are you then using communications or alerts to the facilities manager to let them know recycling is really full, you got to change this out uh, to, and does that shut down the whole system or how does that sort of affect the operation? And two, in the live deployments that you got, I think you said you've got 414 units out in the wild. What's been the feedback from the end users? Are they are they seeing increased buffers as they deploy, as they deposit trash because they have to do one item by one item? Are they choosing to go to a manual facility and exiting the queue because of that? What's been the behavior of the, the, the trash depositors? Yeah, yeah, the reception's been great. One of the cool things is that um, you can kind of engage with the system. You can kind of hang out, get like, what's the robot doing when I throw my item away? Or like in the airport environment, you know, maybe you're on your way to your flight and a big rush, you just toss it in there and trust the robot to take care of the rest. Um, it only takes us about five to six seconds to, you know, identify that item and then sort it into the proper bin. Um, so the market reception has been great. I think, uh, you know, especially in places like airports, like stadiums, um, the public's just really excited to see that there are significant strides being taken. Um, and the, the facility is really taking responsibility for the waste they need to separate as opposed to deferring that responsibility to the end user. What is the price of the system? Um, so right now in the United States, we're right around $8,000, but that also includes um, your software subscription for the first and second year, um, and then as well, maintenance and service contracts. So everyone wants, wants to have a robot, no one wants to take care of a robot. Um, so what we do is uh, we'll just come out, do a managed install, four quarterly preventative health checks, and you know, we're really prioritizing uptime with the system given the high stress environments it operates in. What if what if the system can't identify the object deposited? Does it just put it in the least controversial source and landfill or what is how does it treat that exception? 
Exactly. And then we look at those exceptions um, and recategorize and reclassify our data. Every once in a while, bottlers will kind of trick us up with something that maybe looks like a can, whatever it's a bottle or vice versa. Um, so we're definitely like not just always going, oh, it must be trash. But um, generally speaking, if you throw a shoe away in there and we don't see shoes very often, you know, it's going to send that to the landfill just to avoid contaminating the other streams. Okay, then I have a question. I, if I remember correctly, um, I read a study some time ago that it's the most inefficient part of recycling if everybody sorts trash themselves. And it's far more efficient to collect everything, have just one truck, bringing it to one facility, and then do your sorting there. Um, that from an environmental perspective, that's the better solution. Now you go the other way. Um, what made you go there? Yeah, so a lot of our customers um, aren't able to actually get their, their, their recycling they collect at their facility recycled. Here in the U.S., we have really uh, low thresholds for contamination, usually around like 5 to 10 percent. So that means that if one in 10 people, you know, miscorrectly sorts their item, um, chances are the, the recycling facilities are going to go, actually, we don't, we don't want this waste. Um, so we're really trying to get rid of that big barrier for entry that they're seeing um, in order to just get the trash hauled to the material recovery facility where it's um, you know, turned into those commodities. Mm -hmm. And then I have a second question, like if I imagine um, airport in Germany, train stations in Germany, you already have the different boxes. Why mm -hmm. should they now invest another 8,000 euros to replace the existing boxes? Um, we have a very good education system in Europe, or in many European countries, about how to sort waste. Um, do, you, do you mainly think about the US or do you also target Europe? Um, we haven't talked to Germany. I know there's definitely like Germany as well as like the Netherlands region. Um, you know, those people, like you guys have done a phenomenal job at recycling and it's a lot less convoluted as it is, say, here in the United States yeah. as well as Australia. Um, but we're definitely working with facilities who are struggling to sort their waste. Um, I think like some of the things that are, have been done in places like Germany and the Netherlands are things that, you know, we're kind of modeling for our customers, you know, helping them kind of implement best practices that, you know, might negate the use for the trash bot at every single waste receptacle. But I think like it, there, are, there is a lot of uh, warranted use. I mean, I know personally, I know a ton of friends that have gone to Germany and they're all terrible at recycling. So, you know, um, it definitely can help prevent any like tourism kind of uh, polluting the waste streams there where you, you know, the general public's phenomenal. So how do you, like target your customers is there a is it a general product because i assume the reaction between will be between no way i'm paying uh such an amount for a trash can to this is what we need so how do you find how do you do your targeting yeah so i think like um yeah you know, it's mostly blue chip facilities you know, really prominent locations, but normally we, our, our whole kind of thesis is that, you know, wherever there's the largest amount of foot tra traffic, the largest amount of waste generated by the public um, is where we can make the largest impact. And, you know, we just personally reach out and, you know, kind of go, hey, is this a problem for you guys? If, if so, maybe it's worth checking out our solution. You know, whenever you say an AI powered waste receptacle, <laughs> normally, um, you know, people are at least open to checking it out. And then we also work with a number of partners, such as like JLL, Compass Group, um, you know, Sodexo is another one we've worked with in the past to, you know, really work with a breadth of customers who are struggling with these same issues. And a lot of times they'll bring their customers to us. For instance, we just brought on uh, Hubert Packard um, in that instance, you know, putting about 15 trash bots across Texas and Oregon. And the ones that choose your solution, is this a clear ROI or more of a environmental friendly main uh, kind of, what's their main uh, um, reason to use you? Is this ROI dollars or is it like a more of an ESG thing? I think it comes down to like consistency of results as well as ROI. So 
a lot of our customers have made like zero waste commitments by 2025. You know, they did that back in 2020. It's 2023 now and they haven't made a whole lot of progress. Um, so they're looking to solutions that are really reliable um, as far as the results they generate. And then definitely looking to kind of cut costs around some of their investments in zero waste. Um, for instance, you know, to do a, a waste audit in a commercial office building, usually you're looking at almost $10,000 for consulting services that might yield a result, might not, where our system kind of combines that along with the operational benefits and the, the kind of promise of reducing contamination. Um, and then education is huge for our customer base. Um, everyone wants to solve the problem, but they don't want to like kind of leave the public complacent either. Um, so the fact that we're addressing that in a way that, you know, doesn't rely on that public for the results our clients are looking for, um, I think is especially exciting for them. And we've also won like a ton of, like we just won half a million dollars from the EPA and, you know, we can kind of figure out different ways to, you know, subsidize, you know, reduce the barrier for entry for certain types of clients or for large scale orders. We obviously plan on driving that cost down, but currently we're manufacturing in the United States and Boston, Massachusetts. So super high level of quality, but at the same time, you know, uh, usually the best products aren't the cheapest. Fine, she brings us to 10 minutes. Oh. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, so Thanks, to, for fairness, we got to cut it at, at 10. Um, of but course. that actually should uh, do it for uh, all of our competitors. Thank you all very much for your presentation. So now I'm going to send off the judges to do their thing. Um, they're going to make the final decision here. So you have a separate call link uh, to, to follow. Don't forget to mute and turn off your cameras. Uh, and then once you have made a decision, give us a, a shout here and come on back. Uh, but in the meantime, um, I get to ask the startup some questions here as a way, but I want to mostly prioritize the questions that you all have sent in. So we're actually going to start with uh, one for Earth Rover from um, uh, Jason Black. How does Earth Rover compare to the work being done by Verdant? Uh, Verdant. Now you're going to test my memory. I think Verdant is still running chemicals, if I remember rightly. Um, let me just double check my slide deck. I think they're still running a sea and spray solution, um, which of course means that they are not going to be, you know, chem chemically zero or herbicide zero effects and zero chemical. Um, is a number of them out there. There's about twenty or thirty different robot applications for weed. So. Forgive me for being a little bit slow off the mark there because I don't want to give you the wrong one. Verdant Robotics, yes, they're still running a sea and spray solution. <laughs> so the significant difference, of course, is they're still running herbicides, even if it's even smaller at small amount. I actually had kind of a follow-up question on that, but I was curious about what kind of light do you use to kill the weeds? Uh, so we use very low power uh, source diode uh, light concentrated through a lens. So we effectively, we, we take the collimated light, decollimate it by focusing it on a focal point, which hits the meristem of the weed. Uh, our nearest competitors running high powered lasers are five to 12 times more energy hungry than we are, which is why we're able to run with battery and solar panel uh, and obviously a much lower cost solution without running diesel backup power generators. Great, thank you. I had another question, but I wanted to actually try to get to, to more, and I'll come back to you if I okay. if I have uh, some others. So there was another question um, for uh, Clean Robotics. So what is the most expensive part in the trash bot? Can this be made very inexpensive under $1,000? Uh, that, uh, that that's, a, that's a phenomenal question. So um, I definitely have to say the stainless steel shell. Um, so when you look at TrashBot, it, it's wrapped in a lot of stainless to be designed to be able to like survive five years in a really brutal environment. Um, and one of the things we're excited about is like uh, we chose that material because it's really circular. It's really easy to, to recycle stainless and there's a huge market for it here in the United States. Um, we're currently looking at ways that we could possibly make the stainless like a little bit uh, thinner, but at the same time, don't want to sacrifice durability. We've looked at various plastics, but due to the five-year life cycle of our product, we just feel as if you know, refurbishment is probably the route that we're gonna go down. Um, just maintaining those shells and then swapping out the electronical components that, that actually expire after those five years of wear. 
Excellent. Well, thank you for that question and that response. Uh, I wanted to move on to Cycle Watch. Actually, I'm very positive on bicycles in, in the United States. I think it would solve a lot of our, our issues that we have here. Um, I was curious if you had thoughts as to how something like this might actually potentially increase adoption in the United States for, for bicycles if people had this easy way to, to clean them robotically. Um, I mean, if you buy expensive bikes and in US you do buy expensive bikes. So if I look in the stores, they're selling you expensive bikes, right? And um, you do need less maintenance. Uh, and also it's easier to do inspection. You know, if you have some issues with the chain, I mean, if there is, it's all black and you can't really see the, the links, you know, if it's clean, then, you know, it increases the life of, of the bike, definitely. Yeah. And especially for e-bikes. So the e-bikes, they need more regular kind of washing up and, you know, so it's, yeah, it does have a huge impact on the, on the, yeah, survivability of the bike. It's also looking new. So you are tending to keep the bike longer and not just go and buy a new one. Uh, and in Germany, we have this uh, company um, sponsored bike scheme. So the, the employer puts in like, it's a benefit. So they, they will sponsor or they will partly pay the financing. And also the government will pay the financing. And, and one of the is, uh, things in the financing contract is that these bikes have to be regularly maintained and washed. So that's something that the owners then have to do. So it's really positive for us in that case. Uh, just imagine we have uh, uh, half the bikes in Germany now are e-bikes. Everyone in Germany owns a bike. Yeah. Um, like it's around 80 million bikes, but that's around 40 million are e-bikes. Um, and maybe half of them are all financed. And in the financing contract, it's written that they need to be cleaned and maintained. So this will catch up, I guess, uh, in your uh, in US. But what I think is really cool in US are the bike trails. I mean, that is like massive, you know? So we should put these all around bike trails. So before you put the bikes in your cars, you could get rid of all the mud and dirt. And I mean, this would be fantastic. And all the Mountain Creek or, or West Coast and Colorado. I mean, in summer, you have so many bike trails. I mean, all of those places need one. <laughs> and in the cities, when people don't have a garden or, you know, where they're going to clean it, some of them are washing this in their bathtubs and it's disgusting, you know. <laughs> so bike rooms, you have a lot of bike rooms, like in Boston, like we're based in Boston. Uh, every big building has a bike room. Yeah. And I think it's mandatory from the government, from the city of Boston, that they should have a bike room. And this actually fits there. I mean, just yesterday I was out with a friend uh, riding e-bike and uh, we are 20, 30 kilometers and it becomes a habit. You just push it. We have our own bike machine, washing machine. So, but it just becomes a habit. So if it's in a bike room, the people will just push it in, clean it and then put it on the racks. It just, in Norway, we had like 40, 50 bike owners and in half a year they had 2000 washes. So I guess every time they were going out, they were just cleaning and then putting it. So it's just change management. It's like changing the behavior, you know? Right, right. Great. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Excuse me, I was on mute. Um, I had a question for uh, Nila Robotics. I uh, was curious about your thoughts on uh, the length of the field of, of medical robotics, how long that has actually been along. And I don't think a lot of people actually realize that um, it's, a, it's a very established field. And maybe what have you learned from, from previous iterations of surgical robots that you're then deploying in your own? Yes, well, <clears throat> thanks for the question. Uh, I had another experience uh, 10 years ago to start a, another robotic company. We developed a surgical robot. And then, of course, uh, to, to, to do a, a full surgical robot is a big, uh, big challenge. And so we didn't finish. We had a prototype sitting there and that's it. Uh, robotic surgery has been around since about 20 years, uh, the beginning of 2000, uh, 2003, I think, uh, Intuitive Surgical started to have some success by luck, actually, and and then it be, it's been developing so far. Uh, right now, there are uh, two major competitors of Intuitive Surgical, Medtronics and uh, Cambridge Medical Research. And uh, but you know one thing that is interesting is that you know we speak a lot about robotic surgery, but the penetration of the market is about zero point six percent. 
So, you know, the, 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 the possibility are huge. And the, the problem is that these robots tend to be very, very expensive. Uh, you know, for a robot that was designed 20 years ago, of course, at that time, there were no knowledge, there was no technology and so forth, and, and the price was, was uh, uh, somehow justified. But today, we can make a robot much cheaper. And you know, to, to be successful, we start even cheaper. Our small robot is uh, a small device. Is you know, it's, it's a big thing to call it a robot. Is uh, just a needle positioner, and and then hopefully we'll grow from there. Great, thank you. Uh, and actually, for Rucka, I had kind of a, a related question. I, I think surgical robotics, medical robotics in general, are, are interesting because they really show that. Um, robots the vast majority of the time are not replacements for human labor they're they're this sort of tool to be used especially in a medical context and i was wondering if you had uh, thoughts on that going forward as the field develops and and matures um how we might see more of these really uh, impressive complicated robotics being used as as tools for for doctors and nurses not necessarily a replacement for them yeah i think you're right about that i think um the uh, there's several things that are that are in my view a little bit uh, shame with robotics in healthcare so far. I think first of all, I think uh, robotics uh, does not serve healthcare enough at this point, and that's uh, partly why you know what what you're alluding to that there are these uh, big machines that then um, they 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 work alongside the doctors. Um, I think that. Uh, we could do a lot more to replace some of the human element. Um, and I think what we want to replace is monotonous and um, not really, you know, um, added value type of activities. So when most people think about robotics in healthcare, they imagine telemanipulation tools such as the Da Vinci robot. Um, our robot, for example, and I think there will be more robots of that kind, is um, you know autonomous, so it doesn't require the doctor for this very repetitive and actually also um, it's also a tiring activity to ultrasound scan you know <laughs> hundreds of patients. So um, I think in the future the, the 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 workforce will be getting older and weaker and you know less keen on performing lots of physically straining tasks. And we will see more and more of these autonomous robots that will take over repetitive tasks from, from, from human operators. Um, I think telemanipulation is also still has a massive place because for insurance reasons, there are plenty of uh, surg surgeries where you will not see autonomous robots probably for quite some time. But in these lower risk uh, environments, I think the you know, autonomous robot really has a place in the future and can really take off workload. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, and then Earth Rover, actually, to return to the question I wanted to ask in the beginning, um, I get maybe five or six pitches a week of, of somebody doing indoor farming and that being the, the future that we should all rely on our crops coming from these indoor farms. I'm rather skeptical of that. And I was wondering if you have thoughts um, as to you know the utility of this sun-powered kind of agriculture going forward, but also how robots like yours can, can help essentially take some of the that that uh, the use cases from the indoor environment and, and put it outside. Yeah, I think um, it well, it really depends on how much area, area you want to cover um, and where you want to grow your crop as well. Um, the best use of indoor applications I've seen is reducing the, the carbon output, shall we say the greenhouse gas output from distribution. So having it more localized to where it's got to be used. Um, where we could help, it depends on the growing medium, of course, uh, but certainly with the crop monitoring and scouting. So you're monitoring crop growth patterns. Uh, there's nothing to say we can't use the light for dealing with other forms of fungal infection of, of, of the crop itself. Uh, that's all on the future development plan. Excellent. Thank you. And then uh, another question uh, about a mobile robot for um for clean robotics. So uh, could you have a mobile trash can uh, to consider in the future, uh, which I think has been in any number of movies, uh, a cute little robot running around picking up the trash, uh, <laughs> but, but is, is a mobile robot in the future? Yeah, we, um, we definitely like thought about a more mobile version 
Uh, I think like the biggest challenge comes into like kind of the current battery technology available, um, just kind of like how long that would last and like what, you know, the operational maintenance of that would be. Um, also, as you as the judges alluded earlier, you know, the cost of the system isn't particularly cheap right now. So um, I'm sure as we drive that cost down, we could kind of consider, uh, you know, more mobile options. But we also just have to think about what kind of costs the market can bear. Excellent. Well, if it, if it becomes a thing, I, I want it modeled up for something in a movie and I want it to be very cute. That is that is my demand. <laughs> um, I, I think yeah, I think a, a question actually both for for Needle Eye and Rocka maybe to to um, give input on is uh, I, I'm interested in you know, this very difficult problem of robotic manipulation historically. Um, have we really gotten to a point where for cases like like the surgical context or, or the arthritis context um, is manipulation not so much a problem anymore if you've really kind of narrowed it and defined it down into these specific cases? So a question both for uh, Nita Lai and Rapka to, to uh, put in front. All right. Well, let me get started. Uh, you know, as you see, our our uh, solution is is for percutaneous interventions. So basically, we are positioning a uh, a guide for a needle, and so the the manipulation is very simple. Just inserted the needle. Eventually, we will be do it also autonomously. But in Europe, we have this uh, new regulation that just started last uh, December, where all these uh, uh, safe uh, related. Uh, operation has to be supervised by a human. So it's not clear whether, you know, fully autonomous needle insertion will be compatible with the new regulation. For for the time being, we are just uh, positioning autonomously, identifying everything autonomously, then the surgeon will stick the needle into the patient. The same thing will be the therapy. Therapy is already, uh, the machine for the therapy are already uh, commercially viable. So uh, it, uh, it uh, so will not be require, require any effort from us in addition. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I think it depends really on what you're doing. Um, if you're doing something that is somewhat invasive, I think there's probably much more of a concern if you're doing something like we do or maybe rehab. But like we do in ultrasound, there's obviously um, not, not a big, uh, not as big a risk. And, um, and there's also obviously instant feedback. So, you know, as you land an ultrasound probe, you can always, you know, compare uh, what, are, what are we seeing. And then the, um, the LBR net from KUKA, which we're using, obviously has great force uh, feedback. So it's super sensitive and safe. So if you would lift the hand on that, on that screen, uh, upwards, the, the robotic arm would move alongside your hand. So I think... Uh, for our purposes, it, this is uh, well well on its way on being uh, solved. Great, thanks for that. Uh, another question for for CycleWatch. I think you had mentioned uh, when the judges were asking a question that the system uh, uses AI to detect what kind of bike it is uh, and adjust for that. Um, I thought that was this interesting, given the diversity of different kind of bikes that you have um, people using, like a little a Brompton a foldable bike versus one of those stretch cargo bikes. Um, I was wondering if you could give us more detail about how that actually works, like how, uh, not necessarily how does the AI detect it, but how does the machine then adapt to different kinds of, uh, of bikes? So basically we have four fixed profiles at the moment to make it simple. So it's a kid's bike, it's a racing bike, it's a mountain bike, and it's a city bike. So. And based on that, the parameters on the motors, the amount of soap use, the, the length of the, 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 the movement of the brushes, the areas where it needs to stop, the ultrasonic going on and off, all of that is based on a profile. So we have, based on the, the type of bike, we have a different cleaning profile. And, and that is something which is then yeah, used, basically, based on the type of bike, which we use the AI to detect. I mean, the whole idea here is to go not only for cleaning bikes, but all kinds of other objects, right? And we would also want to start using not only water, because water is going to be so precious, I think in 10 years, 20 years from now. And there are ways where you can clean without water. For example, you, how do you clean home? You vacuum, right? So how do you clean dust off some parts in the workshops? You just use pressure air, right? So, and then we have dry eyes, we have lasers. There are all kinds of stuff 
ultrasonics. I mean, steam, you can use steam and use a lot less water. So based on the type of object, a different profile would be used and a different method would be used. So this could become like a universal machine. Yeah. So that's where um, we are trying to get to. With bikes, we know there are lots of bikes to clean and, you know, they're becoming the primary mode of transport in the cities, especially e-bikes. And they're expensive. So the willingness to pay 10 bucks for that is, is very high. Like we have repeat customers, like a guy who has an e-bike. I can tell you one example. So uh, in Denmark, they sold a bike or they're selling a bike for three and a half thousand euros. And they are even selling a free wash for two years coupons for 1,500 euros. You wouldn't believe it. And they have sold a couple of them. So the guy buys three and a half thousand euro bike and then he has 1,500 euro. He can wash as much as he wants using the robot. And people are buying that. So the willingness to pay is, is quite high. Yeah. So, um, but our vision is to really make, you know, go in the direction of AI and robotics and, and use more of object recognition, use this this kind of different cleaning methods and save water and, and use less energy. And then, yeah, we have a cleaning industry hasn't changed much since 60, 70 years. Somebody developed the pressure washer and then with that, you're shooting everything. It's not cleaning. It's actually destroying the thing. Put your hand on, under it going to bleed yeah that's not the way you clean stuff yeah no thank you yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right thanks for that actually coming back to to earth rover um kind of uh extending the labor question to you as well um at least in the united states we have severe shortages of labor for agriculture and uh, i was wondering if you're hearing that from from customers that uh, you know increasingly automated with robots is, is going to be in fact, necessary going forward, just given labor shortages. Uh, absolutely, it's a it's a global problem. Um, I've just spent five years working out in India with a major tractor manufacturer, and it's a very similar scene even there. Come from populous countries such as India. Um, I think that the easiest answer I can give is the same answer that I got from somebody, one of the farmers we went and spoke to. Uh, and I said, how many of these would you typically want on your farm? He said, I'll have 24 for next season, please, because the people aren't available and the ones that are are a pain to work with. <laughs> so it's now joking aside, it's, it's an increasing problem across the world from a cost and an availability point of view, which means the main solution has to be through robotics uh, and therefore through AI with robots. Thank you very much. I see some judges trickling back in. Does that mean that we are ready to pop over to you? Give them just a second here. If not, just say the word, word and I'll, I'll keep asking questions for the, the competitors. Matt, I think all the judges are back now, so they will be giving their final remarks and uh, final decision for for the grand finale. Thanks. Okay, excellent. Thank you then. Over to you. joining right now and Kelly as well. Sorry for that. Hey, is Kelly back? Issues. Okay. Gillen, then I'm ready to go. Yeah. Good. Then uh, we had a very great discussion uh, among the, the jury members. And in the end, um, the decision was between the two top teams. We agreed very easily on the two top ones, but then 
we had a very uh, interesting discussion about the pros and the cons, uh, and uh, we had um, our certain criteria that we looked at uh, between the top two. And I'm very happy to announce that the winner of this startup factor, innovation startup factory is Rocco. Congratulations. I think this is the applause for you. <laughs> um, and um, let me start with uh, giving one of the reasons and one that um, at least we from KUKA can also judge a little bit. Um, we believe very much in the team. We have seen a very dedicated team, very passionate, but also um, having a very entrepreneurial sense um, in making their solution uh, work and impacting the lives of people. So we think this is a very good solution. And I hand over to my fellow judges to also explain a little bit why we came to that decision. Maybe you both, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think overall on the problem, we thought this really resonated with the group. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, how we've had people in our, our, our personal networks that have been um, uh, diagnosed with this and, and sort of the challenges of even having to wait two years. So I think the problem really resonated. And I think then, uh, then how you defined that in order to build the business made a ton of sense to us to be able to address really part of the problem being um, the rheumatologist's actual constraints, their ability to treat and diagnose um, uh, these patients. Uh, on the market side, this is a, a fantastic founder market fit in terms of identifying the, the problem areas that Will has just talked about. And then this is a multi-billion dollar market, as well as something very important for saving lives. On the growth potential, we thought that uh, the business model that combines the hardware and software services sales is uh, right way to go. It, it provides the company with a repeatable uh, revenue and a, a, a huge uh, growth potential. And on the technology side, you know, this is a, an event AI for good. And it's clear that Roca is using AI to really improve and enhance uh, the diagnostics that they can do. Um, we also saw long-term potential that gathering that data, they can make better diagnosis going forward. Um, and really improve the lives of people. So um, we felt that they they made a strong effort in using this technology for good. Congratulations. Am I allowed to speak? <laughs> thank you very much. This is uh, this is fantastic. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. This is this is huge for us. Uh, it's a uh, huge. Um, for you know, bringing attention to the to the problem of RA and and you know to one of the potential solutions using robots, and um, yeah, it's it's yeah, I feel very humble here yeah, now. Um, that's great. It's, it's it's fantastic, and and also you know to hear this from experts in so many different fields. Um, incubators, investors uh, from industry developing it's 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 really it's, it's great for great for us and we also look forward to working with more with KUKA we are already working you know with KUKA and KUKA has been very helpful um, in the development um, of the robot and yeah it's been really really great thank you Maybe as the judges, we can also, um, we would also like to thank all the other teams. Um, I think this is very important. We started our conversation with uh, how amazing the pictures were and how much you want to influence um, and, and make the world better. So in a certain sense, I think making it to the final today is already a, a big success. And there was only one winning team, so we couldn't select two or three we would have, we definitely would have. So um, for those who didn't win, I hope you're not disappointed because you are on a good path. And we hope that you all continue and don't give up, um, even if it's a little bit more difficult than you thought. Exactly. And I would like to encourage all the judges, if you would like to mention uh, the benefits you would like to provide to the winning a startup today, that would be, that would be fantastic. And then maybe I start as well. So besides the price, um, we already announced that 
Um, we're going to offering you a coaching or mentoring session, and um, we also open up the KUKA network to probably different stakeholders than the one you talked before to see um, how we can continue to collaborate. Um, and if the other companies want, want to, or the other startups want to reach out, um, I'm definitely there for conversation. Thank you. Exactly. Maybe Tom? Sure, yeah. So um, Masterbotics is, is pleased to offer to Rupka um, the ability to uh, join our, our facility um, and uh, share in the benefits that we provide our startups. We currently uh, work with about 77 startups. We also have a specialty group, um, a, a working group in medical robotics um, that is, is sponsored by Festo and a number of other partners. Um, and we'd uh, love to make the connections and help them as they go in their journey uh, to becoming a, 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 hopefully a very successful company. That's fantastic. Thanks, Tom. And uh, maybe uh, Will? Sure. So uh, like some of the other judges, happy to provide mentorship to both Ropka as well as uh, the remaining companies. I've spent a lot of time working with uh, robotics companies like Boston Dynamics and Fetch as, uh, as they went in market and generated from $0 of sales to $60 million of sales on the first couple of years. And happy to talk about some of those growth strategies and how that's worked, uh, as well as um, a fellow SoftBank alum uh, alongside me and, and myself are launching a fund focused on early stage robotics and AI companies and happy to uh, host all of the companies to pitch as that gets stood up. Thanks a lot, Will. Maybe uh, Kelly. So, so for, for DCVC, we're, we're happy to host a pitch as well as provide mentorship given the, the amount of time that we spend in both the robotics space as well as healthcare, bio, pharma. So very much in our wheelhouse. Fantastic. And last but not least, uh, Meraf. So happy to, to host some uh, pitch for all of the startups uh, and connect them to our robotics team if there's a need or uh, some of the startups, they may be able to use our technologies. Uh, so happy to set uh, one by uh, one on one and, and take it from there. So thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much to all of you. And a big thanks to our finalists, juries, as well to all the participants today, but as well throughout all the Robotics for Good Innovation Factory 2022-2023. This first edition of the United Nations Startup pitch, Pitching Competition focusing on robotic solutions to advance the sustainable development goals. And for the finalists today, today Robka, will keep in touch with you and have another closed session to hear more about your business plan in detail and help you explore more business opportunities. We are also very much looking forward welcoming all the participating startups in today's uh, uh, Robotics for Good Innovation Factory grand finale in Geneva for the Robotics for Good, uh, for the for the AI for Good, sorry, uh, Global Summit, 6th, 7th July. And of course, Robka, the winner of today's session, will also be participating in the AI for Good Innovation Factory grand finale during the AI for Good Global Summit 2023 in Geneva. We also encourage you to check out the AF Wood program online to see more sessions that may be of interest to you. And the next Robotics for Wood Innovation Factory session is to be held in November 2023. An application is open already to all kinds of startups using AI and robotics to make social impact and help to achieve the sustainable development goals. So stay tuned, uh, tuned with us and we very much hope to see you again next time. So have a lovely day or afternoon or evening or sweet dreams for some of you in the nighttime. So thank you very much and see you all in Geneva. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions. Like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for good. AI is a powerful tool.
This summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values.